How you guys doing? You guys excited? You like my uh, plum Bible my mom got me? It looks really good, doesn't it? Adam, this is just for you, bud. It looks good, doesn't it? Well, I wanted to uh, read a verse to you guys before we got into the Word real quick. It's out of the Passion Translation. It's in uh, Proverbs. I was reading this this morning, and I thought it spoke to me, so it could probably speak to you too. So when we go into speaking, the, uh, sharing that, I want you to have this verse in mind. Proverbs chapter 2, it says this. Mm, make sure I find it. Yeah. Uh, my, ch- my child, will you, uh, will you treasure my wisdom? Then and only then will you acquire it. And only if you accept my advice and hide it within, uh, uh, hide it within will you succeed. Here's the, here's the key. Say, here's the key. Verse 2. So train your heart to listen when I speak and open your spirit wide to expand your discernment, then pass it on to your sons and your daughters. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we're so narrow-minded and we get so focused in our, in, our, in our life and what we do and how we do things that we forget to realize he's wanting to speak in such a greater way. So that was my prayer this morning. This is my prayer for you tonight that as we're sharing the word of God together that you would open wide your spirit and expand your discernment Amen. and hear the, hear the Lord speak tonight. Amen? Amen? So tonight's message title is going to be called The Culture Clash. Culture Clash. It's going to be called The Culture Clash. Let me get my notes out here. So here's something to open up with. Today we live in, uh, we live in the most advanced times in history. From the houses we live in to the phones we use, the world as we know it, is always evolving and transforming year after year. With that being said, the ability to access God's word, messages uh, from ministers, songs, study tools, and what is needed to aid in our relationship growth with God is unlimited. The day has come and the time is now where we have no more excuse. Even with these convenient technological advances, has this led us down a path of compromise and complacency? So, Since the beginning of this time until now, since the beginning of time until now, we have seen the culture clash between man and God. So something I want to open up with is, you know, we really have no excuse, right? God's made everything available for us to understand his word, understand our purpose, understand our identity, right? We're trained and equipped. We have screens. We have uh, notes put on apps that we can use here at this church, but has what's convenient and and, and meant to be a tool caused us to lose our intentionality to pursue the Father personally. See, it's easy for me to go and log on my my message on Sunday morning because someone's been spending time in His presence to get something for me. But it, it costs me what? My time. Me putting down my phone. Me getting out of the culture called life and actually going to be intentional with the Lord. How many of you remember the first time you were saved? Raise your hand. Man, do you, you all, man, your Pastor Paul talk about it, and all you all in the room could probably name that day or that time where, man, you had an encounter with God. Let me ask you, is your discipline now the same as your discipline then? Is your focus now the same as your focus then? Or has the culture clash come to mess you up a little bit? Because why? We don't live in this culture. We're in this culture, but we're not of this culture. Right? We have a, we've been taught from week after week about what? We, come on, we live from heavenly places. Come on, we're seated what? Far above. Right? So we're, we're seated there. So I want to talk about this culture clash because I really believe that it's not a matter of God not wanting to move. It's a matter of we willing to move out of what's comfortable to us. You don't always have to have it your way. Well, Kyle, I do this, I do that. But who gave you the ability to do this and do that? He did. So I just want to challenge us tonight. I'm guilty of coming complacent and convenient. Someone else does this, someone else does that. But man, there's nothing like it. Pastor Paul, he talked about running the other day. And he said the first, the first mile or so was kind of aggravating. But man, once he pushed through, pressed through, right? All of a sudden, he's like, I could run forever. See, there's the same thing with God. It's not always fun to wake up in the morning and pray. It's not always fun to say, hey, the first thing I'm going to do when I get my car is turn on worship music. 
man, the first thing I want to do before I go to bed, last thing I do, I'm, I'm going to get more. We don't want to do that. But see, that's where the push comes because he has a purpose in mind to be in shape. So it gives him a reason to wake up to go and run because he sees somewhere he's going. So if maybe you are that person like I have been uh, and has become complacent and comfortable and compromised, maybe you've lost focus of your purpose. Because, see, I don't wake up to find purpose. I wake up because I got purpose. Come on, when I get up in the morning, I know my mission is seek and save. I know my mission is I'm going to go be the light. I know the mission is not, hey, I'm going to sing about the revival. I am the revival. Come on, when Jesus walks into the room, what? Everything changes. He lives on the inside of you. And when you walk into that workplace and you walk in around your peers and your family, you've got to have a knowing, not a knowledge. Not a knowledge. Come on, I could sit and have a knowledge all day long. But what causes me to move is when I have a knowing. Come on, when I can begin to lay hands on somebody, I'm not thinking God heal them. He's going to do it. I'm not thinking God speak through me when I get up here. He's going to speak. Why? Because he lives on the inside of me. Come on, have we become complacent and compromised in just this knowledge of who he is and how awesome he is, but we've lacked the stepping out on things. Come on, anybody can sit and have faith, but nobody that had faith sat all the time. They moved. Come on, and sometimes moving is sitting. Don't get me wrong now. Come on, sometimes, come on, Mary, Adam and I were talking one day. Mary, she didn't tell nobody about she was pregnant with Jesus, but she was on a journey of being patient. But she still kept up being the mother she was supposed to be. She kept being, walking in one with her husband and doing what she did, right? So there is still action in being patient, actually. There's still action. Just because there's a delay... It just means there's something bigger. See, a lot of times we think delay means derailed. And that's not true. You're not derailed. And you're not delayed, right? The flight, come on, you paid for your flight to go to Florida. I'm going to pay for one at the end of this month. We already paid for one to go. If my flight's delayed, it's not because of on my end. I purchased it. We paid for it. All these things. It's just something is interfering right now. But it's in transit. So so I just want to encourage you all tonight. Come on, that we're not going to be a people that's complacent. We're not going to be a people that's just going to, you know, mooch off everybody else's disciplines and going after the Lord. we got to have our own walk with God. Come on, I remember Pastor Paul back 10 years ago when I got born again. This year will be 10 years I got born again here at this church, actually, about right here. And I got filled with the Holy Ghost back there. But I remember I'd show up, and I didn't know how to pray, and I just watched him pray, like, you know, it's kind of awkward, you know, but he didn't say nothing. But then, eventually, he said, hey, you going to pray? And I said, yeah, and I eventually learned. So it's just knowing, but I made a decision. I made a decision to come and learn. I made a decision to say, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't just watch him for so long. i got to get off the sideline and get into the game. Amen. Come on. I'm not going to be, I was singing down there earlier, the Lord put on my heart. Not to, I'm not silent and on the sideline, but I'm running into the fight with a song in my mouth. Come on, some of you have been silented and sidelined, but not tonight. No more, because there's people out on the playing field that need you. They need you. Your coworkers need you. Your family needs you. Come on. When you know he's on the inside of you, you won't give up on that kid that's not saved. You won't give up on that coworker. You won't give up on that neighbor. You won't give up on that state and that community. Why? Because you've got a knowing that he's on the inside of you, that you were once sidelined, but you're no longer. You're in the game. Amen. And you're going to make a difference. Why? Because he lives and moves and has his being in you. Amen? This is not even in the notes. This is free. I... I we just get up here and follow the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go to my notes now. So the culture clash. So point number one, the clash began. And I'm going to read, I'll, we'll have some scriptures. I'll just reference them. Um, but Genesis chapter 3, we know what? Adam sinned in the garden, right? We know when he sinned, he, he fell and he made the mistake and whatnot. Now sin, he went from what? He never knew sin, never messed up. To now sin entered the world. So guess what? That's where the clash began. Right? Not just with the flesh, sin, but now also with Satan. Now we also know before then, when you read in your Bible, in some different places, I'll give you these references, like Ezekiel, 
28, verses 12 through 17, or uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, right? These are places you can go read, and it talks about the, the account of Satan being removed from heaven, right? So now we see these clash that wasn't but now is, right? We, we all have been a part of the clash, right? We were born into the clash. We were born into two cultures, heaven and earth, fighting one another. We were born into that. You weren't taught that. You weren't raised in that. You were just born into it. You didn't have a choice. But yet Jesus came, right? Second point, the clash confronted. Jesus came. And Jesus himself, what came in person, the Lord himself came in person to confront the clash. If you go to Matthew, we'll turn there real quick, chapter 4. You guys doing okay? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4. Well, if I could turn my pages a little better, we'd get there a little faster. So Matthew chapter 4, it says this in verse, verse 1. We'll read here just for a little bit. I think it's important. That's another thing. There's something about, you know, uh, like I'm talking about being intentional. I know I'm not against pixels or paper or whatever, but there's something about when you have to remember, where's my Bible at? Right? How many of y'all know where your debit card is right now? How many of y'all know where your Social Security card is right now? How many of y'all know the passcode to safes that you got? But you have more attention that's put on that because you don't want to lose it than you do the very thing that can change your life forever. I'm not condemning you. There's no hard feelings here. But there's something about when you have become intentional. It's almost like the Bible is that invitation to say, hey, come be a part of what's going on, dude. Come be a part of the party that's happening. Come be a part of the unseen thing you're not really seeing, but I want you to really see so you can be a part of it. And now you can go and bring other people to the party. You can bring other people through these doors, and, and they may come in and be like, I don't know what in the world's going on, but all of a sudden you say, hey, let me actually, I was invited to the same party. Hey, Bill, I'm going to show you what's really going on here. But if I don't ever put a priority on the invitation, how can I ever expect anybody that I bring to want to come anyway? Come on, right? There's an invitation. And we're getting into the invitation, and we're joining the party. So... Uh, Matthew chapter 4, it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, verse 2. And when he, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Verse 4, but he answered, oh, it's up there, awesome. Answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Notice in the first thing that, that Jesus got tempted with was where he was weakened and lacking. Come on, the culture clash, where you're weak and where you're lacking in. You're not feeling good today. You don't, you don't maybe have the money everybody else has, right? You don't have the job everybody else has. You're, whatever the case may be, the enemy came and tempted him where he was weakened and lack at. But what Jesus said, I don't live by bread alone. Come on, I don't live by what the world says. I don't live by my condition. I don't live by what I'm being told. I live by what? By every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what I live by. Follow me? Let's keep going. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the ho uh, whoop, yeah, to a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The second place the enemy is going to want what he tempted Jesus, where he was in lack and where he was weak at, the second place he was, he was if you want to call it tempted in, was the word. See, the devil knows the Bible. He just chooses not to believe it. Could it be that maybe the reason why we are falling so much and we become so unintentional in our walk with God that the one who, act, the very thing that was meant to empower you, it's actually become a weapon to, to paralyze you because he knows it better than you do? Hello? Come on, he, he, he used to believe this thing. 
and he threw it out. He gave it up because of his own selfish attitude and his ways of wanting to do stuff. And a third of the angels fell with him. Isn't it the thought of that even maybe the decision of, you, of us not really knowing this word better than him is there's people that are attached to us with an influence that we cause them to fall to? Because we may not know the word like we should. Come on, I'm, when I say no, I don't, I'm, let me fix myself. I'm not talking about a knowledge. See, a knowing, as we were taught here, is that Hebrew word, Greek word, yada, and it means uh, to know intimately. See, so when we have a choice that we made to become one with Jesus, now we not just read about a knowledge of him, but now I get to read about the one who's in me, the one who, who dwells within me. And I have a knowledge of that. Not a knowledge, but a knowing. You understand? Let's keep going. Verse 8. And again the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and, and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you. Fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship the Lord, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. See, if the enemy can't get you where you're weak and lacked in, right? You got you know, hey. You ain't touching my family, ain't touching my kids, ain't touching my health. Come on, you ain't going to get me there. All right. Second thing he comes to tempt you with is what? First thing was where you're weak and lack. Second thing was the word. Come on, there's a, there's a, come, he come to challenge the word that's on the inside of you. And, and I feel to say this too. There's been some words that God has given some of you in the room that you need to start picking up and speaking again. Because that word's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't care if you were two years old. I don't care if you were in the womb and mom and dad. Maybe the word you actually got wasn't for you. It was actually for your grandkids. It was actually for your child. Come on. So don't let off. I just hear the Lord say, pick up the word again and let it come out of your mouth. Come on. And listen, because see, here's the thing. It's one thing to say something because you, know, because you have a knowledge of it. It's another thing to shout something when you believe what you got. Well, come on, let me, because see, that's the thing. It's the culture clash, right? Hey, don't be too, don't be too loud. Don't, don't be too bold about that. We don't do that here. And I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm just talking about everyday life. Don't be too confident. Oh, you're arrogant. No, I just know what I got, man. Because I put the time in the gym to get fit because you didn't. See, during off-season, you were goofing off, but I was pushing the weight, so when open season came, I was ready. Come on now. It's too late to go dig out your camo when deer season's over. And what was meant for you to kill, somebody else got because of our lack of preparation. Come on, but when you've got a passion about something, come on, I work with guys at work that love to hunt, and they're in the stand, it don't matter. They know it all because they are passionate. You don't have to ask them where it's at or what to do. They love it. And that's the same thing about this word that's on the inside of you. Come on, pick that word up again. Not just this word, but the word that he's given you. I don't know what that word is. But it can never, listen, everything that God does happens and is put into motion through your mouth. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Everything that's put into motion comes through the speaking out of your mouth. I can have the very promise, every word that I needs right here, but it'll never come out or come to happen until I speak. Why? Why does the enemy want to silence your praise? Why does he want to isolate you? Because if he can isolate you, he can silence you, he can take you out. Because he's now removed you, not just from your ability to enforce victory, but those to help shield you when you're fighting. Now you're over here and no one can help me. Well, amen. So the third thing was a deal maker. I got to, thought I forgot about it. The third point was a deal maker. So if he can't get you where you're weak and lack at, if he can't get you with the word that's true, he'll try to make a deal with you. He'll try to make a deal with you. Come on. He'll try to make a deal. Just sell out. It's okay. Just settle. It's all right. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Even when culture says it's okay to live how you want to live, it's not okay to live how you want to live. Come on. It doesn't have to. Listen, I'm all about this process of transformation and sanctification and renewing your mind, but it doesn't have to be a drawn-out thing. Come on. If I've been born again for five years and I'm still dealing with the same thing, there's a problem. I'm just being honest. 
right? If I keep, and maybe it's a lack of me being taught, but when you really come down to it and remove the culture clash, it's always somebody else's fault, right? That's what culture says. Oh, it's Pastor Paul's fault. I don't really know what the Bible says. It's, it's, it's my wife's fault. She doesn't really get, wake me up to tell me I need to do this, or it's my husband's fault. No! Come on! It's no one's fault but yours. And that's the thing, the culture clash. We live in a society, it's all about me, 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 I, I, I. But guess what? When you get into the kingdom and you make your life all about him, he'll make life all about you. When you begin to love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, you'll begin to love your neighbor like you love yourself. Maybe the reason why we have such a problem with everybody around us is because we can't even see ourselves right. Because we love people how we love ourselves. Right, anybody that's ever dealt with an addictive behavior, anything in your life, it's, it, it, it's all rooted in because you don't see yourself right. And, and you're trying to feel an insecurity in your life with something else. You don't need delivered from something. You need to see yourself better. See, for the longest time, because I used to deal with pornography in my life. It used to be a struggle. I used to deal with it. But I always thought, well, I got born again. How come... It's still there. Well, it's not a matter of that I didn't get freed. It was the, me realizing not every thought's my thought. Just because a bird flies over your head doesn't mean it has to make a nest there. But see, if I don't know my word, I won't know how to fight, and I'll be isolated, and I'll be away from people, and I'll be sidelined. But see, we're talking about what the clash was confronted Jesus was confronted with this culture clash of sin in the flesh, and the devil. But you notice what? He overcame. So guess what you can do? You can overcome. Okay, I got to run. I got to get my notes. Holy cow, where'd time go? So the third point was the clash is crushed. John, uh, John 19.30, Jesus said what? It is finished. Sin no longer had power over flesh. Sin no longer had power over man. Why? Because Jesus destroyed the clash. He crushed it. He destroyed it. And it was totally done. John 16, 33. Jesus overcame the world. So what? You can overcome the world. So now that we know what? That this clash began. We know this clash was confronted. And we know that this clash was crushed. Now I have, what's my part? It's the three C's, just for Pastor Paul. The first C is there's a choice. There's a choice. You have a choice to make today, to no longer be a part of the culture that you used to be in. You have a choice today to say, I'm no longer going to be complacent. I'm no longer going to be uh, uh, selfish. I'm going to become intentional like I never have before. Why? Because when I got married, it didn't stop there. It just began. Right? When you say yes to God, it just didn't, it didn't just all happen and come together. It just now started. And what used to be how I wanted to do things and where I wanted to go and how I wanted to do it, that ended. Because there had to become what? An agreement for, for unity to happen, for, for God's blessing to happen in my marriage. This culture clash that you've been dealing with, it can end by you simply making a decision today or remaking that decision to say, I'm making the choice to be a part of the kingdom. And this culture will no longer collide with me, but I'm going to start colliding with the culture that people are going through, that people are facing. Why? It's an offensive thing. Christians were never meant to be defensive. You were never meant to be defensive, ever. I want to give you an example, and then I'll wrap up because I know I'm a little over. Sorry. So I have these two chairs here. Look at them. Aren't they cute? The little blue one's better than this one. All right. Who am I going to pick on? Oh, don't they look so one super stable and one really unstable? Let's see. Who am I going to pick on? Who are we going to pick on? Hmm. Coach Scott, Brian, come here. Real quick. I call him Coach Scott because he was my track coach. So, and he still looks just as young as he did then. But we won't say how long it was. So we're going to use this little analogy real quick. So Coach Scott, you're a smart guy, wise guy. But when you look at these two chairs, 
let's just be really honest. Don't think of any experience you've ever had with either of these. Pretend like you're looking at them brand new. What one would you trust more to hold you? And it's not because you're fat. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you're a bigger guy. So what would you trust? You're not. You're not. You're not. I got to let that know. You're, you're good. Husky. It's all right. <laughs> that doesn't do any better. But anyway, back to the analogy. Which one would you trust more if you looked at it? Why is that? Uh, the uh, chair legs are more spaced out. Okay. It bounds me better. It bounds you better. So this chair appears to be, to my eyes, more sturdy, more strength, and more controlled. But this, you're like, what in the world is that? This, it looks nothing compared to that. Right? Follow me? So now I want us to do something. I want you to sit in, one, sit in this chair. You trusted this one, right? I want you to sit in that one first. Ah, oh, so comfortable, right? You don't have to be on your toes, do you? You're just comfortable? Cool. Now I want you to sit on this one. Can everyone hold you? Make sure you're not too husky to break this. <laughs> well, we may be. Hold on here, guys. Ah, uh, whoa. Does it still hold you up? Still Does it still support you? It's got me. It's got you. Okay, thank you. So let me tell you the reason why I did that. A lot of times God's, see, we have to learn to put our weight on his word. And a lot of times our situations look so big that we don't think that his word could handle it. It looks so small and minute. But all God is saying, will you put your weight on even though your mind doesn't get it, even though your feelings don't get it, even though your, your people around you don't get it, I just want you to take a seat on what I call my word and look, it'll hold you up. But you'll never know if his word will hold you until you sit down. And God's asking, will you sit on my word again? Will you sit on my word? Come on, in this culture clash, will you sit on my word for your family, for your community, for your church? Because it's easy to sit on somebody else's word. Because you can see it, you can understand it. But you look at this thing, you're like, God, are you kidding me? That's the answer to my marriage problems. Yeah, take a seat. I dare you. Wait, hold on. Are you sure? Yeah, just take a seat. But here's a cool thing. Move these out of the way. But not only is it taking a seat on God's word, it's another step further, and then I'll close. You guys all right? Sure? All right, cool. So it's to know this, is that I can sit on his word, and that's cool. That's just like Mary. She sat on his word. She trusted what he said. Come on, we made the choice to say, Jesus, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to sit on your word. But then there's a part to play in this. Because sitting is not just, there's no, that, there is an action. But there's a point that when I begin to walk by faith and not by sight, there's sitting, yes, to a degree, I have faith because I have patience and the Lord's instructed me to say, hey, be patient. But on a lot of God's promises, there takes action. So it's much, much like shoes. I can't pop these off real quick. They're laced. But then I have to take another perspective. His promise isn't just something I sit on. It's something I walk out every single day. See, right? The ability not just to comfort me and support me, but to take me somewhere I've never been is waiting for me just to lace up. Come on, how many of y'all ever been in sports? Some of the greatest times you ever had was when you were laced up, when you were strapped up. Come on, right? When you were, when you were clothed up and you had your uniform or whatever the case may be. But it's because you made a decision to put the camo on, to get in the deer stand, to wait for that animal. Or right, to go, to go out and, and, and to go and find that deal on that item that you've been looking to shop for. You had to make a decision, not just to sit on what you saw online, but to put your shoes on and say, I'm going to go get that deal. And God's just saying, will you go get the deal, right? And the last and final thing, so I have a choice, I have a commitment, right? But then the third thing, and we can close here, Someone wants to play, they can play. If no one's in here, they can't play. It's okay. No big deal. You can play. I don't care. Go for it. She's awesome. She's been here. She's so great. I love her. She's amazing. So she plays, and I want you to think about some things. You can put your phone away, your Bible away. I just want you to close your eyes. I just want you to close your eyes for a second. You, we're not, you don't have to write anything down. I just want you to focus right now. And see, here's the thing. 
you may have been in this culture clash and you know I look across the room and a majority of you have made the choice to know him as Lord and a lot of you have committed but the third and final point is have you made the decision to consecrate your life to God and I don't mean just saying hey I'm a Christian I go to FCF I got the Jesus fish on my my bumper sticker I'm known as the guy that loves everybody and gives them nice hugs or the person that that, 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 no, no, I'm talking about when no one sees you, are you the same person? Come on, because God's calling us as a church to a place of, of something greater, something deeper. But we'll never see the mover crying out for until he moves on the inside of us. But it takes a people that says, God, I'm going to consecrate my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take up my cross, God, today. I don't care what people think about me because I know what you say about me and it's good and it's all that matters. I don't care what the doctors say because your word says I'm healed. I'm not moved or discouraged. Come on, the culture clash was over when Jesus crushed it. But we got to make this decision to say I'm not just going to be his son and his daughter, but I'm going to do this thing every single day. Day. Are you saying, Kyle, are we going to be perfect at it? No, you're not. But it's you waking up and you have that conviction. Hey, son, go here, go there. Don't do this, don't do that. If you're born again in the room and maybe that's convictions left, I have to ask you, are you consecrated? Because, see, there are people in the Bible, like Moses, who said, God, I'm not going to go unless your presence goes with me. Come on, there was, there was Jacob who wrestled the angel and said, I'm not letting go until you bless me, Lord. Hold on, there's even another one. The disciples, when Jesus looked up and they just had a, a big confrontation and people left, he said, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And they, that people left and walked away, got offended, got mad. He said, are you going to go too? And he said, where else do we have to go? You have the words of life. Well, there's a decision that has to be made tonight in our hearts personally to say I'm going to consecrate myself to God because in the Old Testament one of the jobs of the people at the altar was they had to remove old ashes for the fire to continue to burn and this is what I'll close on tonight it's time to get rid of some old ashes because see when you walk away from a fire it no longer has an intentionality to burn. It starts to go out. And sometimes we're living on past victories, and they're great. And we're living on past words, and they're great. But God's wanting to set a greater blaze on the inside of you. But if you put too much wood on that fire with all the ash, it'll never burn. It'll actually smolder out. Come on, the very thing that God wants to do in our lives and in this valley, it could smolder us out if the ashes aren't out of the way and there's a fresh flame that's burning. So tonight I'm not gonna do an altar, I'm not necessarily gonna do an altar call, but I'm gonna challenge people to say, you know what, Kyle, there's some ashes in my life. I just need to get out of the way. Opinions that people have had about me for years, situations that I've been through, I've never talked to nobody about. Whatever the case may be, I just want you to the altar is open, and I want to challenge you to just come and say, God. I'm getting the ashes out of the way so you can burn in me like you want to burn. Come on, whoever you are, it, you're more welcome to come. Come on, it's a challenge to anybody. No one's looking down on you. If you've got ashes in your life, you say, man, I just got to get the ashes out of the way, man. I'm going to get them out of the way. You can do it right there in your seat too. Father, so we thank you tonight that we're getting the ashes out of the way. And we say, God, we're not going unless your spirit goes with us in this church. We're going where you go, Holy Ghost. We're not concerned of man's opinion. We're not concerned of what people think about us because we know what you think about us, and it's good, and it's great, and it's amazing. And, Father, I pray tonight that you would stir up intentionality in our lives. You would stir up, God. May the desires to do the things that we used to do just diminish in the name of Jesus things that's trying to pop their head up again. You actually already defeated that. Don't think you haven't. Just because it raises its ugly head doesn't mean you've not overcome it. You have. 
Father, I thank you tonight that we are a people that is consecrated, a people that have made a choice and a commitment to say, God, we're burning for you. So, Lord, I thank you tonight. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence, Lord. What you feel right now, you can have everywhere you go. Every step you take. It's because all of a sudden, earlier you may have not felt what you felt like you're doing right now. It's not because God wasn't moving or she started playing. It's because you took your senses and your awareness and you put it on Him and all of a sudden He become real to you. So I want to challenge you. Just because you don't have an awesome pianist or awesome worship, it doesn't take that. It just takes you saying, God, I'm aware of you right now. You can be anywhere you're at. And I thank you, you're here with me. And all of a sudden, he shows up. So you guys can look at me now. So I want to say, you know what? Let the fire burn. Come on, the ashes are out of the way. And this week, whatever you do, wherever you go, I challenge you, evaluate your life. Pastor Paul used to always tell us when I was in the youth ministry, and he still does today. Sometimes the car has to go to the shop sometimes. And we got to evaluate ourselves. Come on. We have to, we, I mean, come on, like seriously. Like I get to represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I get to carry the very power that the moment I lay hands on somebody, God begins to destroy whatever they're going through. Is that not crazy or what? but I don't carry it with honor. If anything, I don't want my life to be an insult to the cross. I want it to exalt Him. And I know you guys are people in the room that your lives exalt God. Your lives exalt God, but I challenge you, go deeper, go further. Come on, press that one mile. Get, if you can't run, guess what? Get a running buddy. Call somebody up. Hey, man, wake me up. I'm, get, I'm being serious. Because as a church, we're a family that's going to see a city shaken, a state shaken. But it starts with this decision we've made tonight. to say, God, the ashes aren't going to be in the way anymore. And I'm going to let this thing burn like it's never burned before. Amen? So, that's all I have. I mean, I got, listen, I could stay like this. Like for hours and hours and hours. Like, it, no. <laughs> I was like, no. But I'm serious. Like, I just want to challenge you. The culture in, in church is we stop when we walk out those doors. And you'll never see revival in our lives if that's how we treat it. Come on. The moment, pa if, 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 if we hit the light switch off, the electricity never left, but the connection did. And if I learn to live with the switch on all the time, I'll begin to see God light up things that I've never seen lit up. People touch like I've wanted to see Him touch. People healed like I, come on. So I just want to challenge you guys. Maybe if the culture's creeped in and said, hey, don't, don't, don't take what you learned tonight and go look at it. Just put it away till next week. No, come on. I'm guilty. I'll be the first one. But I promise the moment I started taking home what I got taught on Sunday when I was in youth ministry and I started reading it, this don't make no sense to me. What in the world's he talking about? What are these leaders teaching me? And then all of a sudden, God showed up. And I began to learn this culture can be everywhere, every moment, every second of my entire life. And it's not a feeling, but it's a knowing that He is with me everywhere that I go. Amen.